guys. I've got a few special guests on Drifting today. We've got Eric and Mo Newman of Journey South Outfitters from Venice, Louisiana, a premier inshore and offshore fishing lodge and operation out of Venice. And we also have Carter Andrews. Um, Carter's a really special guy, I've done as much fishing as anybody on the planet. He's got a TV show called The Passion of Carter Andrews. They both bring great perspective to the sport. They're a lifelong, passionate, driven outdoors people and also conservationists. Enjoy this conversation. How are y'all holding up? Um, it's interesting. It's scary. Yep. You get, nope. are, you, are the ramps open? Can you put the CV in and go cruise around in the ocean or? We, we can go, I mean, technically you're still allowed to charter here, but we, um, we shut it down a while back just to kind of be a part of the solution and not the problem. Yeah. And help mitigate the whole thing. But, um, there's a couple of guys getting a few trips in here and there, but it was at first people were still wanting to come and charter. And then it's, they all kind of, the travel shut down, travel shut down all the restrictions to Louisiana from Texas and Florida and other States. So it's, it's pretty much dried up. Yeah. So we're hoping to maybe start May 1st, but right now it's not looking like that just because no, all our guests are flying in and nobody's wanting to fly. So now we're trying to find people who are in driving distance. And New Orleans is kind of like in the news for being an epicenter coming up here soon. So that doesn't help. Yes. Yeah, that doesn't help. Um, but I don't know. We'll see. There's a lot of unknowns. How about you, Carter? What's happening? Are you in Jackson Hole? No, you know what? We don't. I don't live in Jackson anymore. I live in Florida. Oh, okay. In a little town called Vero, and um, we're on a farm. I got the girls here. We got four, yeah. forty plus animals that we deal with, and and I'm fishing every chance I get. Yeah. <laughs> is the obviously the show so, is kind of on hold, huh? I got all my episodes in. I got everything done. Um, I just, I sneaked in the last two episodes, um, right, I mean, as this was kind of closing down, I got uh, three guys that I've worked with here locally, so I didn't have to have anybody fly in. Uh, they could all go back to their houses at night, and we're really lucky. We just got the shows done uh, here in Vero, Fast and Furious, and they, they actually turned out to be maybe one of my best episodes of the year, probably. Oh, nice. So, is this like your seventh or eighth season with this program? Uh, you're right. So this is my seventh season uh, doing the obsession. Awesome, man. Let's what, Carter? We're gonna be on your. Are we on your seventh season or eighth season when we film? What's What's gonna be September? That's eight season eight. That'll be eight. season eight. That'll be season eight. I guess we're I, gonna do another at least two, if not three, episodes. I guess I'll be in season nine, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Dude, weird. I think I, you, you know what? You haven't invited me anywhere. You you, you haven't invited me. Well, I, I respect the hell out of you, man. Going back to the one fly and just your accomplishments in fishing are pretty, pretty extraordinary, buddy. And you're. Uh -huh. You're a Hall of Famer. I'm proud to know you. I, I'd like to have more opportunities to spend some time, catch up. Well, thank you. I got lucky. I got lucky in the one fly, three three years in a row. <laughs> yeah, luck might have had something to do with it, as it always does in fishing. But there was something else going on there. You know, I've I've kind of. Uh... I, I was. I'm a Houston kid, and kind of grew up in the urban parts of Houston back when it was still, there was country all around. My life doesn't feel all that different. So I'm just trying to imagine and empathize with all our brothers and sisters around the world that are in crowded urban areas. That was never something I could really deal with, but that's a totally different experience right now. I mean, like I said, I mean, I, I'm near the water, I'm near the woods, and so I have to walk around and just imagine what's happening because I really, aside from the news, I really don't have a firsthand glimpse of it. I don't know anyone who's been sick. I haven't 
None of my clients have reported back to me that they've been ill. It's just such a crazy deal. Billy, did we get you on board somehow? Hey, brother, man. Hey, how are you? Am I supposed to be here? Hey, I'm not going to kick you off. We've got one together tomorrow as well, just you and I. Oh, I thought I was today. <laughs> Friday, from what I understand. But, hey, now that you're here, just, now that you're here. Just, That's the funniest thing. Listen, <laughs> I'm on serious meds. <laughs> Good. Hey, can you, the postal, the postal service is still operating. Spread those around. That's ah, yeah. Listen, it's on the way. Package is on the way. Oh. Well, at least I know I'm a Zoom virgin, so at least now I know uh, how to work this this thing. Well, sorry to interrupt you. Hey, this Carter. <laughs> hey, y'all. Yes, how sir, you doing? buddy. <laughs> hey, man. I miss you, brother. <laughs> Much love. Hey, listen, we JT. Sorry to jump. You're not interrupting a thing, buddy. You're welcome to stay. If you've scheduled some time, you got nothing else to do. Just stay on board and talk to us about it. You'll be our our inner city, you know, our urban reference to this whole crazy thing. Uh, I'll bring you down, man. It's not pretty here. I know. I know. I've got a lot yeah. of friends in the restaurant industry here in Austin that, that are suffering pretty bad, and I can only imagine. Yeah. Outside of that, the people here are just getting tidal wave on top of us right now over in Brooklyn and you know uh in New York obviously you know where we're just the death toll grows every day and you know I have a lot of affiliation with the doctors here in New York and um it's it's funny you know I have friends from um uh, all walks of life uh doctors that are marathon runners and the most positive inspiring people you can ever meet and you know, you look at them now and they're empty and it's, uh, oh. it's, it's, it's really, it's really, really tough to, uh, to talk to them and try to get, get them some real emotional guidance. Um, not that I'm any expert, but I've had my share of now, you know, I've been meditating, practicing TM for a few years and just doing some stuff, you know, personal reflective stuff of my own that hopefully can help them. But, you know, you see the most confident people and literally on the planet people that are um you know like my friends are like neurosurgeons you know, these guys operate on the most delicate situations in the world and now you know they you know you look at them and they're literally empty and soulless inside because of what they're seeing and these guys have seen it all so um so again i don't want to bring down your conversation here today in a negative way um it's just it's pretty it's pretty impactful here for us folks on the east coast and um you know it's uh it's this, this thing isn't going away anytime soon but it's so it's i'm just i just can't keep, i just keep coming back to the fact that i'm supposed to be on tomorrow right. <laughs> and um i'm like uh i'm the party <laughs> crasher i feel like um vince vaughn crashing someone's wedding right now <laughs> But you know, uh, JT, I love you. I, I, I'm so I was so excited that I'm 24 hours early. So, uh, <laughs> no, I love you. I miss you, Carter. I mean, to see your face, brother. I I I really miss you. And hey, y'all, nice to meet you guys. Hello. How you doing? Good. I'm just some knucklehead who cooks on wood fire in Brooklyn. We've eaten at your like restaurant. It's... We've eaten at your place in Miami. It's wonderful. Oh, no way. Wonderful. Yep. Wonderful. We went there, Thank you. We went there um, in February during the Miami Boat Show. Oh, yeah. Oh, amazing. Oh, cool. Oh, Thank good. you. It's a very special community there. It's a very industrial. I only open in the middle of nowhere. So, um, good for you. Uh, I like it. Yeah, yeah. So, and we try to re re revive the communities, which is something JT and I will talk about tomorrow. But, but anyway, I'm so sorry to interrupt. <laughs> I love you all. Yeti Nation. Thanks, buddy. Good seeing you. And, I, and I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. Carter, Perfect. we have so much to catch up on, bro. Take care, sir. All right. Love you guys. Bye. You tomorrow, Bye. Then, we will. Too. We will. All right. Nice interlude there. Um, I didn't I mean, realize that was helpful. Yeah. That's one thing. Like, can you imagine being a health worker, being an emergency nurse right now? I mean, even, even like, Sackers at the grocery store have become like first line responders to this thing. Yeah. It's, it's just really, really bad. Yeah, I mean, no, it's bad, but imagine being in the restaurant business right now. <laughs> no doubt. Well, we're kind of in that service industry, and you've been in the restaurant. You, you're, you've had your own bistro and stuff, Eric. You've been. Yeah, no, there's definitely, yeah, I mean, 
we're in the service industry, but restaurants, man, it's going to be so tough for those people because even when they do open back up, they're going to have a limited capacity. You know, they might make them sit every other table or do 30% occupancy. And restaurants run on such a tight margin as it is when they, when they go into, like when Bill probably goes into a spot and figures out what his lease is going to be on the amount of square footage, he's thinking about every head he can get in there to have dinner to break even or make profit. And man, I feel so, so bad for the people in the restaurant industry and in the, the future is going to be tough. No doubt. Yeah. So I feel for those guys. Gosh, I, you know, I, I ended up, I think part of the reason I ended up as a guide was just my inability to manage groups of people. I tried it in the, in the woodworking business and, and I was too emotional to be, I think, a really good manager. Um, I kind of wore my stress on my sleeve or, or if, I, if, if times were good, I was too elated, you know, to keep an even keel for, for a group of folks. And so I ended up just managing myself and my boat. And it, it's crazy yeah. how, like, you know, we spent our whole evolution <clears throat> from hunter gatherers to having a small farm and taking care of a bunch of animals and having a bunch of hard work and being totally self sufficient to go into these big urban areas and, and everybody taking on their own role to contribute to a community. And, and, not, and we get all of our stuff by pushing a cart around a grocery store. We don't have to work for all of it. And and if you've lost the skill or never had the skill to live on your own in the country, you're almost doomed in a way right now. Whereas as the folks that are self-reliant living out on the perimeter, those are the people that kind of, kind of uh, aren't really taking it too bad yet on this deal. It's just, it's just interesting. I just, this is all kind of what man's brought upon itself that doesn't take the sorrow from it. Yeah. Just trying to figure it out, man. Is that your personal tackle room or are you in a tackle store, Carl? <laughs> I could push a cart around that place, it looks like. So that, I, 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 I am sitting at my desk. Let me show you just, here's my desk if you see how bad this looks. Organized. And then behind me is my wall of, uh, my wall of stuff. So, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, my wife, uh, she kicked me out of the house and I have this little, uh, this little hut that I kind of go spend my days in. But, you know, I want to, um, mention something that Eric and I were talking about earlier. And, you know, right now we've got, uh, you know, I don't want this whole uh, podcast to be about uh, the virus and what's going on, because I think there are other fun things to talk about all three of our lives and, you know, what we've done and how we've created these, these, uh, these niches for ourselves. But <clears throat> there are a lot of people out there that need to be thanked for what they're doing. A lot of the frontline workers and, and first responders and people um, and then you've got the other side of it, which are close to me, which is the community of guides and, and, and outfitters and lodge owners. A friend of mine here that I do a little bit of work with, Monty Peters, his wife works at the hospital, and he and I were talking the other day, and we want to start um, trying to thank some of these, these people at the hospital for the amount of time that they're putting in, working under stressful conditions, possibly, you know, conditions that, you know, they could also are very susceptible to catching the virus and, and whatnot. Um, and so we were going to take hospital workers fishing, just if they've got some time off, we're going to take some hospital workers fishing and, and just get them out in some fresh air, breathing and, you know, enjoying whether or not they even like fishing or not, they just, you know, get them on the water, get them out there just in a space that is, um, um, well, away from that stress that you're talking about. And like Billy was saying, the, 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 you know, the neurosurgeon, you know, who's just now got nothing in front of him. He's just, he's been faced with so much, um, we talked about it a little bit further. I've been talking to brands, 
like Yeti, who wants to get in. Oh, so let me back up one more second. And then you've got the side of it, like you guys that aren't working right now. And how can I bring these together? Well, that's what Monty and I were going to do. We're going to take people fishing. And then I thought a little bit further, well, why not? Can I get, you know, that whole fishing community to do some, while they've lost all these trips, can they donate some trips and start taking some of these people fishing? And then it went one step further. I said, well, actually these fishing guides are all losing revenue right now and have been losing it for a month and stand to lose it for another three or four months. Uh, why don't I talk to some brands and private individuals and, and, and see if we can't raise enough money that, you know, people are doing something that feels good. We're going to take these people fishing because it feels good, but also, uh, and it's the right thing to do, but you know, maybe there's a way we can get, um, you know, half the, the money coming back from uh, some of these charters. So I've talked to Yeti, I've talked to Shimano, I've talked to Costa, I've talked to Mercury. And, um, you know, the goal is after things start to slow down a little bit, is that maybe we can have, um, you know, a group of guides that are willing to take, uh, you know, first responders, frontline workers and whatnot, and, and get them out on the water uh, but also a way to get maybe a little bit of money back in their pockets for a time that's going to be really, really difficult for the next few months. So it's a feel good thing. It's the right thing to do. But also if we can get some of these brands behind us in it to help make this possible to, to, you know, put some money back in some families' pockets while they're doing the right thing. That's what, um, that's what my goal is. And I talked to Eric about it and he's going to help me figure this out and everything because he loves driving buses like this. Good cause. <laughs> and Mo's going to support him. And hopefully Mo's going to support him. Yeah, he's the bus <laughs> driver and I'm just the one that gathers all the folks. That's so how it works. I think it'd be great motivation for the <laughs> first responders, to, for those guys to hear about it now and say, hey, look, here's some light at the end of the tunnel. When you, when you, when you get done saving lives and have just a second, and then we're going to get you out on the water. I'm, I'm all in. You guys can include me in that for sure. Because it's just a way to say good, good. I, I really thank these people. Indeed. Bill Carter. Carter. He's got a little bit of a loose connection. I no, no, no. I, I was going to, you were breaking up. I couldn't hear you, but I just think, we're going we're gonna to make it right, and uh, you know, it's just going to take a little bit of planning over the next few weeks to get in into place so that um, you know, when, when the end of May, June, July roll around, um, you know, kind of make it a priority to get some of this done and just you know, say thanks. So. In the meantime. Now, now, we can, now that we've done a little bit that I, I just want to hear a little bit more about uh your hunting and gathering and uh are you you know are you still living in no you're in austin now you said uh for the, for the podcast but i'm in i'm in rockport no. texas yeah rockport oh rockport okay rockport yeah and that's where, that's where you fish out of uh redfish and skinny water shallow water stuff on a daily basis that's right yeah 100 percent not as big as the fish on average in Venice. I just drove. Oh, I just. <laughs> that's all right. I just drove over um, and did uh, two days in the Everglades. You want to talk about? I saw zero boats the first day, and I saw two boats the second day. Fortunately, I with a with a guy that knows the Everglades like the back of his hand or I'd still be somewhere in the Everglades. But, uh, you know, we were fishing stuff. We, we were in, uh, you know, a Chittim, one of the new Chittim skiffs that's a, I don't know, a five or six inch draft boat. And it was amazing where we were and where we ran and the fish that we were catching uh, in the back there. I just, um, I've done a lot out of Flamingo. I haven't done so much out of, uh, Chukalusky, and I was just, I was blown away. Blown away. Were you with Brian Helms? So, um, to, no, I was with a guy uh, named Jeffrey uh, 
Quatero, who manages White's tackle up here in Vero, but he's been doing the Everglades privately just himself as an angler for 15, 17 years. And um, I mean, I, he, I, 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 like I said, the first day we went blades and some of this backwater stuff going through literally just canopies of uh, of mangroves to get back in, opening up into these little ponds. And I mean, I'm not really one for counting, but dude, I swear I was getting 50 fish a day, snook and redfish. It was just like, awesome. um, just <laughs> was it setting better the hook, than that setting the hook, setting the hook. I loved it. Was it better than the day you did? Mo, you yeah. know what? I've never had a day. I've never had a better day than the days I've had with Mo. That's why we're fishing buddies. Good. I just want to make sure Jeff didn't talk me there. <laughs> Is the marsh getting a breakout where you guys are, <laughs> Mo? Yeah. We went down, well, we redfished at the beginning of March was the last few days that I redfished. And it was, the river was at, actually low, water was clean, sight fish and redfish, which is rare to do this time of the year, because typically the river's high and everything gets muddy. Um, so before we shut down, I was able to get in a handful of trips of sight fish and some big bulls. One of the biggest was 41 inches. And clients were super jacked and then now the river has is at flood stage and so everything that i got to enjoy at the beginning of march is all now muddy which is kind of a bummer so during this time of the year people don't realize in venice our whole fishery is all around that mississippi river and what it's doing and now all these Fronts are coming through, snow's melting. Now we're getting piles and piles and piles of water coming down, which is pushing muddy, cold water, like 50 degree water, 40 degree water, into all the surrounding estuaries, making it super muddy. And the fish are just lethargic. They're just laying on the bottoms, not wanting to play ball. And right now is the only way to really target redfish is just gonna be your pop and cork with some dead bait, just for the sense. And a lot of people like that is really never told when people are like, Oh, I want to come fly fish and finish. Oh, I want to come sight fish, redfish. It's really a seasonal thing down here. So I was excited in March to see what I got to see clean water, big bulls pushing around. And now it's like a double whammy, you know, we're getting hit with shut down and then you're fun fish and you can't go really sight fish anything right now. So you're just wearing out the burpees and the squats and the barbells, aren't you? Getting in some good <laughs> workouts. <laughs> That's fine. Wow. Eric, crushing you right now? What's that? Is she just crushing you right now? Oh, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> we, we, we got him. He, Eric's recovering from a wrist surgery, so we're, we got him on a walking program. And we're, typically when he is doing good, he does work out with me. He'll just do the elliptical while I do my workouts next to him. And we got music blaring and it's a, a fun atmosphere to kind of be at at five o'clock in the afternoons at Journey South where everyone always sees the big cooking events and everyone there. Well, when it's just him and I, you know, tunes come up and we just have a good time working out and then cooking together. Does So even this time of year with all that cold water, can you guys go farther inland, just way up in the marsh where you're basically, where you can find six inches of water? Will you find backs out on a sunny day? Or so everything yeah. pretty, pretty mellow. Um, down in Venice, like as you push deeper into the marsh, you're gonna get more into the fresh water, where you're gonna have the freshwater catfish and the bass. And you're, some of these ponds are just so deep in there that a lot of redfish don't push into there because they will never see the salinity levels that they need. Where when you go up further to Hopedale and east of New Orleans, then some of your back ponds that have six inches of water, that's where your big crawlers are gonna be, as they call or them. Or way west. You know, you gotta get all the way over to the, the west side of Grand Isle almost. Away from the Mississippi River. Yeah, Cocodri. From that mouth of all that fresh. That yeah, awesome. like Cocodri, Dulac, Dularge, all that stuff going west, so. And there's some, there's some fishing. I mean, you could potentially get them at the islands right now, but the islands are going to start getting affected because they just opened up the Bonacary Spillway, which is a big spillway 
um, on the north side of Lake Pontchartrain. And so all that fresh water is going to bleed from the river through the spillway. And that's going to, so it's just going to be, it'll be a little challenging, but you just make the best of it. Yeah. Does that go down till roughly sometime in May as the water recedes a little bit more? Yeah. yeah. So typically by end of May, you, we should, river should start dropping and come June, July, August, everything's getting clean and pretty. And Carter seen some of our best red fishing, especially in August when it's your pre spawn for all the big bulls. They're in the big bays just gorging on pogies and either you're blind casting flies, throwing top water lures, you're having. 50, 60 fish a day, where at noon you're worn out. And then come September, all these big bulls push offshore to spawn. And then come October, November, December is when they start pushing back into the shallow. Hold, hold, hold on, hold on. What? what? Why, why am I coming in? Why? why are you coming in September? Yeah, well, do, Mo, yeah, wait, after all the big bulls leave? Yeah, remember, we're going to target triple tail. Wait, is y'all's video messing up as bad as mine is? It's your video. It's you, buddy. I think it's your 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 uh, reception, potentially, your internet connection. Is yeah, your connection's bad. It That's seems like, right. yeah, yeah, it seems like JT and ours is like real, real Hold time, on. real time almost, very small delay. We're going to limp through it, Carter. It's going to be all right. All right. Well, so what were you saying in September? In September, when you come yes. down, we're targeting triple tail, and then we're going offshore jigging, not running, jogging, jigging. <laughs> I sent him a text. Let's do an jigging show. They autocorrect it to jogging. And he's like, I don't know about jogging. <laughs> Jogging, Carter, yeah, not happening. I think we're losing Carter. Hey, big boy. How about hog hunting? You guys getting a bow out right now? No. We're supposed to be in Oklahoma turkey at our hunting. least turkey hunting right now, and which turns into hog hunting as well because our place is overran with hogs. Um, is that a lease you guys have or some personal property you have? Oh, uh, it's just a, a big lease that we have just Eric and I, it's our little place to get away after usually a go hard season. Yeah. It's a nice place to relax, decompress. And we um, will go in November to hunt the rut there for two, three weeks. And then we go back after Christmas to just um, harvest some more deer and more pigs and everything we harvest there, we actually put back into the lodge, which is, a lot of our clients actually enjoy. You know, not many people get to have backstrap or even venison poppers or goose poppers. So all the wild game that we uh, kill, we serve to our clients and they love it. And so- And your friends. Oh yeah, we do send down to you too. <laughs> oh man. Just I, I, get, I get all kinds of venison and uh, sausages from them every year that you know, my, I mean, not only, I mean, I enjoy it, but my girls love it. So, it is so I changed, I changed my, uh, my Wi-Fi. So I think maybe I, hopefully I have a better connection. Oh, it's a lot better. It's yeah. way better. Sweet. Yeah, that, that, it was a year ago now, last October that you guys had us all out for, for that Yeti Ambassador Summit and the, the hospitality at Journey South Outfitters, man, and what you guys do is so, so great. That, that was that was an exceptional time. Thank you so much for that. You're welcome. You're very welcome. It was just really fun because we're, we kind of have our own little world down there. We don't get to venture out a lot or meet new people. And to have kind of everybody come to our backyard where we met so many different outdoor um, enthusiasts, Yeti ambassadors there that we never would have crossed paths with. And it really made it special to kind of show them just, you know, our, our little home down there and what we're all about, what the South is about. It was, it was super cool. Even though it, it was raining, it was like 45 degrees and blowing 30 miles an hour the whole time and nobody 
had anything but great things to say. The worst fishing conditions possible, <laughs> but we made it happen. Fishing was surprisingly good, though. Yeah, yeah. when we for the conditions, fishing was very good. Yeah, no, that was that was exceptional, man. And anybody that, that gets an opportunity to come fish with you guys needs to. It's a phenomenal spot. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you, thank you. Carter, when did you make the full move to Florida? You don't have any you don't have any stakes up in Wyoming anymore? Do you <laughs> have a place up there? No, we still have a place in Wyoming. It's a family place. Uh, my brother lives in Wyoming. My sister's in Wyoming. My mom still has um, a place in Wyoming. So we that's that is kind of home. You know, my wife was born and grew up in uh, Jackson Hole. Oh. I was there for about thirty-two years. Um, you know, that was a lot of my background in the fishing industry. Was a a trout fishing guide, float fishing guide on the rivers in. Uh, in Wyoming and Idaho primarily. Uh, and then every chance I got kind of moving up and fishing into Montana. I mean, just the Rocky Mountains is, you know, a, a really special place. And, uh, you know, I like to think of myself as a grizzly bear and grizzly bears like to live in the mountains. So I didn't really imagine myself living in Florida, but having the TV show, it was a little bit easier. You know, the summer times were pretty much Wyoming. Winter times, I was either in the Bahamas or in Panama. And then once the show started, there was so much happening in Florida between boat shows and things like that um, that I needed to attend. It just, it, it kind of seemed like a nice move. My girls love riding horses and my wife grew up riding. And um, I don't know, you know, we were literally, uh, um, sitting at my in-laws place one night here in Vero getting ready to go to the Bahamas for the girls spring vacation. And we're laying in bed looking at the paper and saw this farm for sale. And I called up a friend of mine, it's a real estate agent and said, Hey, we want to go look at that place. He's like, ah, no, there are a lot of other places to look at. And I said, no, we, we want to look at that place. We looked at one place. We bought the place that we looked at and, uh, you know, I mean, it, it happened literally in a matter of months from the time that we even thought about possibly leaving. I never even imagined that I was going to leave Wyoming, but um, it worked out great. And this is a, a little oasis. I'm not sure I could live any further south in Florida. And, you know, much further north is kind of a different place. This is a nice little island. And we've got... Um, you know, our offshore fishing is pretty good. We've got a great sail fishery and um, a lot of dolphin. The reef fishing is really good. Our beach fishing for the tarpon and snook and, you know, our inshore cobia bite is really strong. We have some permit that run the beach. One of the shows that I did was on Jack Creval just two weeks ago, fishing these 20, 30, 35 pound fish that were in schools of three and 400 running down the beaches, just you know, incredibly visual sight fishing. And then we also had the river. We have the Indian River, um, which we're having water quality issues like a lot of places in Florida. Um, not necessarily the same issues that the Everglades is seeing because of the lack of water getting to the Everglades and too much water going east and west. We're just above the Okeechobee discharges. So ours is really runoff from the land. Um, people fertilizing their lawns too much or too much weed killer or, you know, but we're, the Indian River itself has got some serious issues. Uh, you know, eight years ago, even maybe six years ago, the turtle grass flats were everywhere. You can't find a blade of turtle grass from basically Stewart all the way up to Titusville or up to Merritt, Merritt Island. It's gone. I mean, uh, we still have pretty decent quality of fishing, but it's just, it's just disappointing to know how much better it could be. The river is struggling and, um, you know, Without that habitat, it's going to just slowly leak away. And it's really up to everybody. It's not just uh, the fishermen. And we're trying to get some movement going on. It's everybody that lives on the river has a responsibility. So, I don't know. Hopefully, we can get something going. Sugar, man. Gosh, if people got sugar out of their diet, 
that's a huge contributor to why that agriculture is so powerful in your in your state. And no, and that that's definitely that's some of the big issues uh, further south of us. Um, everything that Captains for Clean Waters is working for, and everything that they're doing, um, you know. There, I, I can't even imagine how many different water quality issues there are. I was fortunate coming from Wyoming and then coming from Panama and the Bahamas. Uh, I never, ever even thought about water quality issues. And uh, I, I mean, those places have some of the cleanest water in the world. And next thing I know, right in my backyard, I've got these water issues. So that's something that I've been on pretty hard lately and, and trying to educate myself more about it and then educating as many people as I can about these problems and supporting captains for clean water and what they're doing. So. No, that's a pretty amazing group, man. I, I want to, I want to see a chapter of their organization open in Texas. All right. So that's, that's really, really interesting that you just brought that up. Uh, um, and Louisiana too. I mean, that, well, everyone I, I was, has their issues. Yeah. Every, every area definitely has issues and you know, there needs to be organiza organ organizations like captains, you know, it might be clean water in Florida. It might be captains, just the captains in general for Louisiana, because it needs to be a nonprofit that goes in and, 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 and that is not affected by, any political ties or anything. I mean, we have huge issues here, yeah. giant issues in Louisiana. And I was, I, Eric, I was just at their annual gala, the, the, the big one that they have every year in Fort Myers. We also had a media event around that. And at the media event, that's one of the things that I brought up is the success that you're having the rest of the, the rest of the state has problems, but really the rest of the country has water quality issues. And is that something that as you get your hands around this, everything that you've learned, everything that captains has learned and how to deal on that level of government in DC where they've been going and getting all of these issues handled for South Florida, is that something that you could take that learning process and help other people in other states to put together just what you're saying in Louisiana, JT, just what you're saying in Texas and, you know, have other captains for clean waters, um, you know, fighting for water quality issues. And yes, they, they're, they're dealing with the gorilla that they've got in the room right now where the project they started on, but the ultimate plan and the much bigger picture is looking at it, um, certainly on a national basis. So I think that'll be something, I don't know if it's going to come really soon, but uh, you know, I'm trying to start a little branch of that up here that I work directly with them to get things done. And uh, I'll tell you a really good one is uh, y'all, y'all know Benny Blanco. I do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, you know, Benny's got his show that basically goes around the state of Florida um, and is addressing water quality issues in certain places. So he was up here in the Indian River. And then he sits down and has, uh, you know, at the local tackle store or somewhere else, and we have, you know, you know, roundtable discussions or forums. Everybody's, you know, invited in from the community to be a part of it and, and just listen and hear what people have to say. But, you know, right now he's dealing with Florida, but I can see same thing, his show going to other areas that kind of bring awareness to the issues you're having um, that can grow, you know, more than just on the state level. So I don't know, that's something, uh, you know, both of y'all thinking about maybe having Benny come and yeah, Benny's reached out and, and he and Hunter Levine that do the captain's collective podcast. Okay. Okay. We're going to, we're going to get on and talk about it. Uh, our, our issue is not so much water quality, but out of nowhere, came this uh, industrial project from all the oil that lives in the Permian Basin, which is kind of the Midland, Odessa, West Texas area. And since Galveston is full up on their port, they've, they've, they've used eminent domain to run a giant pipeline to Corpus Christi. And what they wanna do is bring super tankers into our estuary through the Port Aransas jetties, which is one of the shallowest estuaries in North America. And the reason they wanna do that rather than to take the oil and continue the pipelines offshore to a, a safer, more manageable offshore loading terminal is because the port of Corpus Christi, which is a small 
elected board of citizens by government agencies can't get paid on, on their land unless those super tankers tie up to their port. So rather than to do the responsible thing and, and take the oil offshore, load the ships off and send them on their way, the Port of Corpus Christi wants to basically dredge to 80 feet through the middle of our, our estuary, which has an average depth of around six feet, hundreds and hundreds of thousands, if not a million acres of a foot or less water with turtle grass, with, you know, with shoal grass, with halidouli grass, with widgeon grass. And one dredging operation could put so much silt in the water column that it would black out photosynthesis for all those species and we would lose our seagrass overnight. Not to mention desalinization plants that are necessary to provide the amount of water that those inshore loading facilities would need. It, it's it's just like, like Florida has been dealing with this agricultural issue that's gained uh, become a problem over time. This is like a light switch that's about to be flipped on us where it goes from, you know, you have Bird Island Basin, which is the national seashore just south of Corpus Christi. It's the largest, longest section of undeveloped beach in North America. Um, we're home to to the migrating flock of whooping cranes that that went from like 20 birds in the 40s that have gotten back up into around the 500 bird range. They all, they all come from about the middle of October to the middle of April before they go back up to Ontario to, to summer. And so, yeah, it's just like all of a sudden we're faced with this massive, and th there's a way to allow industry and a healthy resource to, to coexist, but the shortcuts that the oil industry wants to take and, and our government being, in Texas being pro-industry, they're going to just allow them to make those, those, those moves. That, and, and there's no public outcry because they're so good at, at keeping these projects hush. That, oh man, it's, I mean, and they, and they, got the, they got the money for the yeah. lobbyists too. I mean, yeah. that's, why the, that's why the menhaden industry is untouchable here. I was going to say. Are oh, the, don't even, let's not even start this one. Are the pokey oh, bugs going down? No, I'm not going to open a can of worms. No, 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 no. I'm just kidding. I think we ought to open it. That's a discussion that Eric and I have uh, a lot of. And if that's something that um, that y'all want to talk about, let's get on the. As soon as we leave water quality issues, here's another one that we can really yeah. jump on because have, have they? This, have this they, one, they listen to the, the yeah. The uh, the book is the most important fish in the sea, which is Menhaden, right? And those yes, pokey sir. boats, like when we were there. A year ago October they're just non-stop turning those fish into paste that goes into every bit of fast food that we consume it's incredible take take the floor you guys but what they like the pogi is the main one of the main filters out there and everything eats a pogi you know when these guys saying that the pogies you're killing catfish, trout, jacks, little Spanish mackerel, a whole ecosystem in a sense. And when you take the pogies out of our estuaries. M mention it one more time. They're filter what? Filter feeders. Let people understand feeders. what they're talking about. They're, they're cleaning right. the water. Yes, they're big. They're, I mean, so whatever the quota is on pogies for the menhaden industry in the northern gulf of mexico it i mean i don't know what it was five million pounds last year just say hypothetically I, I can't remember the exact number you're taking a five million pounds of water filtration out of the system they filter all that water so it's so, uh, some people don't look at the whole big picture of everything when they think of they're taking this fish out of the water it's it's it messes up the whole ecosystem and it, like Schmo was saying, everything eats a menhaden or a pogey, whatever you want to call them, bunker, everything from a bluefin tuna, blue marlin, yellowfin tuna, all Mangroves, the way down, everything, all the way down to the, the reef fish species, to speckled trout, croakers, drum, to flounder, catfish. everything, everything eats a menhaden. And so catfish Carter would know that. <laughs> and um, so it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty important part of the, this this system down here and it's obvious if you've studied it at all what it's done to some fisheries look at the chesapeake bay carter you just did a show last year with that gentleman tyler and he opened your eyes on the chesapeake and it's the writings on the wall if you wipe out the pogey menhaden you wipe out the fishery it's that simple Eric, what are they using what are they what are they collecting those fish that massive industry where where are those menhaden where are those pogies going uh, I, everything from, I mean, a, a big part of the, the I think, from what I was told, 
the biggest economic fish oil is the oil for an omega. It, that's the company, Mel. Oh. The the biggest thing is is makeup, makeup, and then the fish oil pills. You know, the the everyone takes fish oil pills now, or less people take it than they used to. But a lot of the fish oil pills, but makeup is a biggest part. But then it goes down into food. They they utilize every part of it. Hey, they JT, them. listen to this. The majority of those boats are all foreign owned vessels. Yeah. Okay. Down South Africa and Canada. And all right. And and something like, I don't really know for sure, but what I've heard in the discussions is that like 90% of all of the product from the those pogies that are being collected in our waters are being used outside of our country. It's not, it's not a resource. It's our resource that we're not using. It's going outside of the country and go back to the Chesapeake Bay for a minute. There are um, seven, there's, there are a couple smaller boats, but seven larger boats, maybe it was nine, but this is good. You're going to get the point. Seven of them. No, they're not nine boats. Each one of those boats is allowed 750,000 pounds per day, okay, per day. And they're purse-saining. So for the people that don't know what purse-saining is, we're talking about a big industrial boat. This isn't commercial fishing. This is industrial fishing. We're talking about an industrial boat that on the back of it launches two boats that wrap a net around an area where the pogies are they have a spotter plane that's flying around in the air that finds the largest congregations of pogies. The boats race over to them. These huge industrial ships race, believe it or not, they're pretty fast. They get to them. They drop the boats. They seen, put a purse seine around the entire area, draw it up tight, and then, you know, start pulling the pogies out. Now the, and they get all bunched up like this. The fish that are there feeding on the pogies are all in the net as well. Up there, it was cobia and, and giant redfish that are up there. And all of that stuff is dying. Once it gets packed into that thing, and they're just discarding them. Eric has videos last year of these boats making strikes. They're only supposed to be in certain areas. Same thing in the Chesapeake Bay. I'm going you know, to let Eric talk about that down there in a minute. But like in the Chesapeake Bay, they're not allowed to be within like two miles or three miles of shore, something like that. And on good days, if the weather's right, they're only supposed to be east of the Bay Bridge Tunnel. When I was there, it was flat calm, but there were no pogies outside of the bay east of the tunnel. They're all in the bay. So all those boats were in the bay working. Now, kudos to... Virginia this year and all those they get their permits through um it's not like state fishing game agencies it's monitoring it it's a bigger group from them than that so they and they're they're the money is huge so they're getting I don't know if they're paying people off but this year the Virginia state of Virginia got involved and said whoa you guys have you know, basically broken the law that we gave you as far as the quotas and how you were going to do it and where you were netting them. So that became kind of a, a big issue. And the state of Virginia did step in this year. And we'll see how that goes for the future. But um, we're talking about nine boats, 750,000 pounds per day, and netting everything that is getting caught in there. So the bycatch is tremendous. It's tremendous. And Eric, tell, I mean, we got videos of I'm sure the bycatch you know, from last year. Bottlenose dolphin and everything else that you can imagine. Sea turtles are all in that net. Yeah, that, and, that's, and that's really the only areas in the Gulf of Mexico that have had res gotten restrictions on them on like a zone where they can't go do a strike are people that have videoed and recorded them killing sea turtles and bottlenose dolphin. And the, the, around the bear, around the Chandelier Islands, there are some zones where they're very strict with them, and that's why they went um, they went in there and they did some strikes during the turtle um, breeding season, and there was a bunch of sea turtles killed, and they got that shut down. But their restrictions off of the Louisiana coast, for the most part, are very lax. Like we went online and looked 
what the restrictions are because we would be fishing on the beach for redfish and these boats would come Nose right, up on the beach. Right, right on the beach and set their nets around all the charter fleet that would be fishing a school of redfish. And one of the biggest things happened to us last October was probably 10 or 15 charter captains out there fishing on a school of bull reds and Jack Ravel with pogies everywhere and the whole, what is there, 12 or 13? How many boats are there? 12, I think there's 13? 12 or 13 um, pogie saners at Bias they Center. came and set up their set right on top of all of us and you have to get out because they're not gonna work around you and then they killed the whole school of everything that we were fishing and then we that's when eric did get oh. photos of okay. dead redfish bulls just floating these are giant vessels yeah they're they're roughly so the ones by us um there's two companies there's omega and daybrook 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 is the one that's right north of Venice and Empire. The factory's there. Omega has um, their factory over on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Um, they're, they're about 125 feet long, 130 foot long um, steel boats. And they got two 40 foot metal skiffs on the back, they call them. And they slide off the back of the boat and they, and they put the strike around. But I mean, they, they're getting more and more aggressive than they ever have before. And I, I mean, to me, the reason they're getting more aggressive is, is they got new owners. Um, Daybrook was owned by a local family for a long time. All the marina owners knew them. Everyone at the wildlife and fisheries knew them. Everyone knew the, the old owners. And the old owners always had a, um, a buffer respect zone for charter captains and recreational fishermen. So the, the planes would spot pogies, and if there was a bunch of charter boats around or fishermen, they would kind of go, let's go find another school of pogies. And um, there's new owners. And with new owners, there's more bills. Um, there's a big, a lot, of, a lot of money that they got to pay for for that buying that business. And those, those operators, those boats don't get paid by the hour. They get paid by the pound. So if they don't produce, the captain, all the crew, those guys don't make a penny. So they get paid on production. So um, it's, it's- It's so much a part, it's so much a part of, of like, and I've, I've, been, I've been going on this thing in my mind for a couple of years now where the most powerful people in the world are consumers. If, if the consumers rally around and make educated choices on what they consume, they consume less of it and they consume wiser. Then all these entities that we view as untouchable, these powerful corporations, they start losing money, they go away if we don't buy what they're selling. And That's there's healthier, healthier alternatives. Like we're all fortunate enough to be hunter and you know, we live, we live a, a lifestyle live where we can provide food from the land. And that's a tremendous, someone in New York City can't do that. But yes, they sir. can learn enough about the impacts of what they buy and where they shop, where they go out to dinner and make sure that those places are using sustainable practices. And I think the biggest part these companies, these lobbyists, these politicians have made it a very divisive issue. Basically, they, they label it as, as, as national interest and jobs. Well, that's not, that's not what we're talking about here. We are, this is not a leftist issue. This is not a conservative issue. This is about true self-sustainability and true national interest, preserving our natural resources for Americans to use wisely, not selling off fish or... or same with the oil that's coming from the Permian Basin. It's pre-sold to South America and China. If you really want to talk about national interest, leave that oil in the ground until the rest of the world's run out and we're the only ones that still have it. Same with Menhaim. I really want people, and I think it's important from Yeti's perspective, uh, who's sponsoring this podcast, to know that we're not going off on some environmentalist rant. We're talking about preserving our environment, preserving our resources, so that America has healthy fisheries, has, has a self-sustaining oil business that cares for, for American use. It's, we're not trying to bash jobs. We're not trying to make industry go away. We're trying to keep it for ourselves and, 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 and practice wise. Like those, those new owners that you mentioned, they're not from here. When there's no more pogies, they pack up their ships and go somewhere else in the world and leave us with, with the destroyed ecosystem on the Gulf Coast. We got to wise up and, and, and stop listening to these secular voices of lobbying power and politicians telling us that, yeah, don't listen to that because that person's against your livelihood, against your, 
your ability to work. It, it just it drives me absolutely insane that any of us would buy that shit. You know, it really does. No, you you hit the nail on the head. And I, I the last thing I want to do is come across as someone just trying to shut an industry down. You're thank you so much for bringing that up. To me, and and it's I guess my personal selfish reasons. I don't want them shut down. I just want to be able for people, the next generation, your kids, Carter's daughters, I want them to be able to come see what's so beautiful about the Mississippi River Delta. You know, and that's, that's my, that's my big, you know, that's where my heart is on the whole thing. And you, everything you said just now is you hit the spot on. It's spot on. That's the artery of our country. The Mississippi River is the coronary artery of America. And it, and it can't just be scraped clean and sent to other continents, man. It's, it's, everybody should, we're, we're not in our jobs right now. This is an opportunity to educate ourselves and take to the streets and keep six foot apart and hold signs and demand changes. And, oh, gosh. But I think no. like as guides and fishermen and outdoorsmen, you know, we see everything that's going on. So it should really be a more responsibility on us to kind of take part and do what we can to preserve what we have. And educate still. people. And ed like all our clients, when we're out there and we see the pogey fleet, or if we see an oil rig taken down, or if we see marsh, you know, they're like, why is all that marsh dead? We tell them what's going on and why, so they can know. And then they see it firsthand. And it kind of leaves an impact on where they can go and just like the snowball effect, tell someone else, tell someone else. And what Eric and I do at Journey South is we try to educate and then try to preserve our fishery as best we can, not over harvesting, not abusing just cause you know, we don't have kids, but everyone has kids in the next generation. That's where, you know, we really want to see that they have a fishery to be able to enjoy like we have. Amen to that. Carter, walk us through kind of uh, exactly what you got going on down there. How, how much property do you have? And, and that, the dog, when your daughter led, led you down the path to that little dinette she had set up, <laughs> is, that on the, is that on the property? <laughs> uh, it's, on, it's on the property. I'm glad she didn't take me to show me a turd like your boys did. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that. It's the contrast in having boys versus girls. I wanted a daughter so bad. Uh, you know, he, he was so proud of that turd that he left there. And my daughter was so proud of that little di dining Same. area. Same. <laughs> <laughs> they were both proud kids, and that's what it matters. How are they dealing with the humidity and the bugs coming from Jackson Hole? Uh, they've gotten used to the humidity. You know, it's funny. I was coming back last night, and uh, and I said, Heidi, you know, I'll be there for dinner and everything. What do you all want me to make? She goes, well, it needs to be a late dinner because – Peyton's riding at seven o'clock. They all, they love their horses and they do a lot of riding and they're training and, and uh, they're showing horses and stuff. And, you know, Peyton wants to ride at seven o'clock because it's not as hot and uh, the humidity is still there, but it's just not as hot. And uh, so they're dealing with it. They're, they've accepted it and make it happen. And part of living on this farm, I mentioned that we have these, oh, 40 plus animals and uh, they always have their chores to do uh, when they come home from school or on weekends, but now it's a little bit more, they're involved more every day. I mean, it's, we're very fortunate to have, uh, instead of being, you know, in a, in a, in a home in a, you know, small community, we're on a farm and have a lot of room to be outside. And, uh, so it's actually our challenge is, is, um, getting them back inside to do their work <laughs> for you got, school. You got like five acres, 50 acres, a couple hundred? But, no, th 30 acres, 32 acres. Perfect. Um, right now we have uh, 11 horses at the barn. Um, some of them are horses that we're boarding for other people. Um, but we also have uh, a mare that we breed and we get foals from her every year. So we're training some horses. We have a couple miniature ponies. We have some goats. Can we share we have... the names? <laughs> uh, I mean, our names uh, and and all the chickens have names, which I can't remember the names of any of the chickens. But uh, my probably one of my favorite names is uh, I got home from fishing one day and 
and I was watching the dogs run something from one clump of bushes to the next clump of bushes. And, you know, I'm on the phone in the truck and in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, they've got an armadillo that they're running around. And the next thing I know, uh, my older daughter, Haley, comes running out to the truck and she's got a piglet wrapped up in her arms. And uh, I'm like, oh, my God. She's like, look what the dogs ran up the back steps into the back door. And she comes out with this piglet. And the girls have been asking for a pig for, you know, a year. But they wanted like a pot belly pig. And uh, uh, these dogs brought this pig from across the street from a wild, you know, we got a bunch of wild pigs in the swamp across the street. And uh, they ran it across. And I'm like, girls, you got your pig now? And they're like, daddy, that's not the kind of pig we wanted. <laughs> So I tried to name him Bacon, and they said, no, we're not naming that pig Bacon. I said, all right, well, his name's going to be Pork Chop. And so Pork Chop stuck, and uh, he's Pork Chop. He's pretty good. Um, I, we got some funny stories about all of our pets' names, but that's uh, – I'll give you one more good one. We have a dog named Storm, one of our beagles. We have two beagles. I've always had big dogs. I had German short hairs. I've had labs. Uh, at a time when I used to do more hunting, but all the traveling that I did, it came really, became really hard to travel with big dogs. I mean, that's, that's just, it, you know, we were going back and forth to the Bahamas with all these dogs and stuff. And like I said, it just became a problem. So beagles, I grew up with beagles in Tennessee and I've always loved them as a breed. So now we have beagles and, uh, I got this one and I named him Storm because of a Carl Heisen book that had uh, a character who had a dog named Storm. Well, I gave the book to our nanny at that time that would go to the Bahamas with us and help take care of the girls. And I told her the story that I'm naming the dog Storm after, uh, you know, this guy, this character in the book and his dog. And she starts reading the book and she comes to me one day and she said, now, where did you get the name of that dog from? I'm like, Storm, the dog in the book. And she's like, you idiot. The dog's name is Strom. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. But so anyhow, Storm stuck, and uh, his name is Storm, and it's, uh, it's been pretty funny. But, uh, yeah, no, living on the farm, we get our eggs every day. The girls go riding. Uh, we have peacocks that disappeared for a while, two female peacocks, and they showed up like three days ago, and they've got strutting males with them now. So, I mean, animals do what animals do, and uh, now we've got um, a couple extra peacocks around the farm. And I want to get some I, background from, 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 from both you guys real quick. So, Carter, you're a Tennessee boy, is that right? I, I I was actually born in Connecticut, but grew up in Tennessee. So I will call myself a good old Southern boy. And you do as much fishing as, as as humanly possible, and you have most of your life. How did that get started for you? I think I understand you were you were chunking some spinner baits and bait casters as a kid for bass. And how did you become to to be such a such a notable fly fisherman? How, tell us what that course was. I mean, it all, I mean, really growing up on a farm in Tennessee, you know, we had the Harpeth River that was right there. And we lived on the Harpeth River. There were a couple farm ponds on the neighboring farms. And it really started with a friend of mine in, um, I don't know, second grade, third grade, that his dad was a semi-professional fisherman. And I would go to the lake with them almost every weekend and I got into fishing with them that then at the same time I'm like well I've got a river here on the farm which you know at that time I mean mom literally at, at 10 years old eight and ten years old I could take off for the entire day take a couple dogs and spend the day with my feet in the mud and 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 walk in the riverbank and catching catfish and drum and every now and then catch a nice bass or something like that. And I really, it was, it was the experience, but also the, kind of just that tug, having the rod in your hand and feeling that. And, um, you know, all through high school and there was a period in college when fishing wasn't as important to me as some other things. So I kind of lost it for a, a little period of time. Thank goodness I caught myself. Um, 
And I was, next thing I know, I was moving to Wyoming uh, with a great opportunity, had nothing to do with fishing. Um, but then kind of the roots came all the way back around. I, I was fishing during all of that time, but I found myself in Jackson Hole. And um, a year later, Jeff Courier, uh, another Yeti ambassador, he actually gave me my first job in the fishing industry, uh, offered me a job guiding for Jack Dennis Sports. And um, that was back in, I moved to Jackson in 88, and that was in maybe um, 89, it might have been 89, but certainly by 90, gave me my first job. Next thing I know, I was built up a client base, and I was guiding, um, you know, 130 days a year, and started doing some destination travel, booking those clients and taking them to other places. And then I decided uh, the winters were getting a little long in Jackson and I really wanted to go live um, and, and, and fish and, and guide and do that all winter long. So that's when I started going to Crooked Island in the Southern Bahamas and went down there and worked with some of the local guys and got them trained up and helped them buy boats and, and build a pretty substantial business in Crooked Island. Uh, and then after Crooked Island, I went to Panama. I uh, met Jose. I met Jose Wahebe while I was in Crooked Island. And, and um, you know, he was a, an incredible inspiration and mentor for me in the saltwater business. That's uh, awesome, Jose, for sure. Yes, thank you. Um, and uh, he's meant a lot to a lot of us, but he really – he taught me so much and got me started and gave me kind of the ideas of how to um, uh, grow my fishing in, in Crooked Island from just the uh, fly fishing, flats fishing uh, for our bonefish and our permit where, you know, the stories I have that, you know, we did together reef fishing and then gradually got into the, the wahoo and the offshore fishing and and marlin fishing, um, where it's, it's just pretty, pretty special. But, um, so that's where kind of the TV as I kind of got immersed in it a little bit, the production company that he worked with was JM outdoors, which was Jerry McKinnis who, uh, had the longest running fishing show ever. Uh, and he had a, a show called the fishing hole. Uh, Jerry McKinnis passed away this year too, but, um, his production company, his son, uh, runs that production company, and I worked with them for a while. We did uh, the ESPN Great Outdoor Games. We did, uh, or they, I did that with them. Also, the Mad Fin, which was an ESPN Catch and Release Shark Tournament. And then after Jose's passing, he asked me, they asked me if I wanted to get involved in, t in TV. And um, I worked with them for a few years, and it went really, really well. Um, they were kind of moving a different direction and I want to do something a little bit different. So, uh, um, I left them about four years ago and have, you know, been doing this and, um, working with Mikey Trevisco and doing a, a, a great job producing TV. And I think part of it for me is really being able to share my passion and my experiences with everybody. I mean, when I was doing it as a fishing guide, I got one-on-one -on -one with somebody and now I'm doing it with TV and I've got my audience, whoever wants to watch it. I feel like I'm sharing that with them every week. So it's gone from one person in my boat or two people in my boat to now, you know, however many are watching it. Uh, so that's pretty fun. And I, I think there are a lot of things that I have coming up uh, that hopefully my voice can work on. Um, my, you know, myself where I am in the fishing industry, as far as, uh, you know, some education and conservation and ethical things. Um, there's a lot, what we've all been talking about today, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm at that point in my career that, uh, I always felt like I've given back, but now I really want to give back and I've got some some pretty special things and Eric and I talk about them all the time because he listens. Uh, so hopefully you're going to see a lot of, you know, new things coming and um, we'll see that that's, that's been my thing. And uh, you know, all these shows that I talk about, I believe now uh, Eric and Mo can correct me, but I think I've done um, maybe nine or 12 episodes or 
I don't know what it uh four, five, six, seven, nine, ten. I don't know how many episodes, yeah, guys. About nine. A lot. Yeah. Nine nine episodes with these guys. And uh part of it is because I, I think that they um share the same passion that I have for the fishing industry um and for entertaining people and uh and the education and, and experience side of things. Um but they also have, you know, Venice, Louisiana, um, one of the greatest, you know, all around fisheries in, in North America, if not the world. Uh, but like a lot of other things, if it's not taken care of, it'll disappear. Indeed. So, um, you know, we have the same message that we want to tell. They live there. I go and visit it, but it's just as important to me as it is to them. And thanks for that, Carter. Um, Eric and Mo, tell me about you guys and, and how you came together and, and your, your lives growing up on the Gulf Coast and how you became uh, one of the premier outfitters there in Venice. All right. Um, first, Eric and I were both born and raised, you know, fishing down here. I did it with my mom and dad. He did it with his dad and then grandpa. We all we both had our own camps. Mine, I was based out of Mississippi fishing out of there and he was fishing kind of close where our camp is now. Yeah, I'm not far away at all. Yeah. My grandfather built a camp in um between Empire and Buras in the early 60s. You know, way out in the marsh. You know, you know, water cistern shower. It was cool. Super cool. And so I grew up there. Like on a barge or a stilted a stilted No, I, built, I mean my grandfather worked for the telephone company and him and all his buddies would save leftover lumber from jobs and pilings and all that. I mean, they built this thing by hand, drove pilings. They would drive pilings by like hand, <laughs> water, dig a hole, start it with the shovel. And, you know, they, that's how they built this camp. Oh, it took them several years to build it. And it was about an hour boat ride from the closest boat launch. And we would, you know, we'd bring dry ice out there and ice. And we'd go out there and stay out there for three or four days. The old timers would go out and put – start trawling with the shrimp trawl to catch shrimp for a boil. The kids would catch, you know, fish to put in the crab traps so we could eat boiled crabs. And it, it, was just, it was just the coolest way to grow up. I mean, just the coolest way. And, you know, Mo's family was the same. It was, you know, just you would look forward to every weekend to go spend time in the water with your family. Yeah, like growing up, the weekend, come Friday, as soon as you're done school, you're heading to the camp. And that's where you spent your weekend until like Sunday, as late as you can make it. And so we kind of had the both same backgrounds growing up and about, when we, like 2008, I guess we met. 2008, yeah. yeah. Look and, at the smile, look at the smile on her face. <laughs> <laughs> like time flies, like every day blends in together. So we met in 2008 and um, went on our first date and that weekend he took me fishing and i remember telling my dad i'm like dad someone's taking me fishing i don't have to take them because prior to that everyone i dated i would have to take fishing and do all that well i had someone that took me fishing and kind of like i do now i backed the boat up i ended up running the boat and we brought chunk along so chunk's been chunk's our 14 year old lab who's been through this the whole way and I remember him dogs aren't coming on the boat and I made it. I was like Chunk comes fishing with me Chunk comes everywhere with me we're a package deal you know you get one or the other it's you know you better like it and so from then on out we fished every weekend together and uh wasn't a serious relationship I still fish with my family and then one weekend I wanted to be social he took my parents without me so he was getting in with mom and dad. He's smart. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we go on and we start kind of doing what we do now. Like people want, were asking us to come take them fishing and having us cook for them. Hey, well, all our family's coming down. Can you and Mo come and cook? Which I'm not the cook. He's the cook. I'm just good stirring. Sous chef, I think, is what we get called. And just the idea of journey south this kind of started evolving without us really even knowing you know and at the end of 2013 
we kind of saw like, hey, we kind of have a niche here, you know, and we really enjoyed taking people fishing, you know, going on their boats, fishing with them, taking care of them after. And, and that's how the unknowingly, how the whole concept of Journey South started coming through was just years of doing it together just out of the pure love of doing it. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I had a, I, I spent a lot of time in the restaurant industry. Um, I always had a fishing problem or I don't know if it's a problem, but always love the fish. And, um, uh, but when I was in the restaurant industry, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of time to go as much as I would like. And so, you know, obviously when we started journey South, it was a perfect blend because we got to share our love for the outdoors and then got to implement some of the culinary cuisine and, you know, every New Orleans is so known for its, its culture and cuisine and food and, um, and hospitality. And so that's when it all come together. But I got a, a, a cool part of the story is, is, is how I met Carter. I think that's something I would like to share. Um, how Mo and I met Carter. So we were fortunate enough to film with Jose Wahebe before he passed. Um, we, we were doing a show. We used to work in the research division for the state. And we were doing a show with Jose. And um, I'll talk about one of my cool experiences with Jose. I'm born and raised in Louisiana. I've never really gotten to fish anywhere outside of Louisiana at this point. And I'm in my, you know, probably mid to late thirties. And we're filming a show with Jose and we're at a rig and we're trying to catch different stuff on vertical jigs, um, conventional fishing. And Jose hooks a fish and we're filming and he's fighting it and it comes up and it's just big giant red snapper. And I'm like, ah, oh, man another one of those. And he's like, Hey, y'all quit filming for a minute. And I'm like, uh Oh, <laughs> everyone's like, uh Oh. And he's like, look, man, you're spoiled. You're spoiled rotten. You get to fish in one of the most amazing fisheries I've ever been to. And he's like, I've fished a lot of places. He's like that 20 pound red snapper is a fish of a lifetime for 95% of the people out there. Just because we can't keep it and go home and eat it it doesn't mean it's not an amazing catch. So that was kind of like an eye opener to me in the industry is being able to film with Jose and, you know, him kind of opening my eyes. It's not all about what you can throw in the cooler and bring back home. It's how lucky you are that you're being able to experience this. So Jose would always tell me about Carter and I knew who Carter was from the shows. And then there was another gentleman that, Jose worked with and Carter worked with Dr. Eric Prince did satellite tag in a blue Marlin from um, University of Miami, I believe. And I did work with him. So there was this connection between Jose and us and Carter and Dr. Prince, us and Carter. And everyone would always say, you need to meet Carter and Heidi. They're a fishing couple. They love cooking and fishing. Yep. It'd be great. And we're just like, you know, okay. No, okay. no, we know what's okay. going to happen. <laughs> and so at Jose's memorial at the IGFA Hall of Fame, which was located in Miami at the time, we went there. And I was standing there and I was talking to Dr. Prince. And he's like, hey, that big guy with the the beard and ponytail over there. That's Carter. I'm like, that is Carter. He's like, come over here. I'll introduce you to. So he introduced us to Carter and Carter's like, look, you and I are going to stay in touch. We're going to hook up. We, we have, you know, our late friend talked about us getting together and we're going to get together and hang out. And Carter and Heidi came to New Orleans for their anniversary one year. And then after they went to New Orleans and ate good food and got their groove on, they came to Venice and Carter got to see Venice and was like, man, this place is cool. And then everything's kind of. Just... And we went to Jackson hole. Yeah. We went to Jackson hole for sure a few days and fishing the coldest stuff we've ever fished. <laughs> Carter, I understand why guiding in the winter was not fun. No, it was freezing. The bro I remember the guides on the fishing rod were freezing up. The line wouldn't go through them. I was like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. These two Southerners were like, ice on the guides like there's a time you draw the line we need to be in the woods not, not on the snake it, on the on the snake river in october <laughs> and it's spitting snow and it's cold and everything and mo is catching uh snake river fine spotted cutthroats on 18 blue wing olives just drifting them down while they're sipping and everything oh it was, oh, it was priceless <laughs> and that was like our prior to this 
I really haven't traveled much other than fishing my water. So that was my first time getting to see something else. And you find yourself more looking up at the surroundings and being a hunter, I was like looking at all that versus the fishing. So beautiful. And it's yeah, it was just picture really thing up there, isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing. Cool. It was cool. Well, you guys, I mean, I, I really appreciate this opportunity to get all of you guys together. You're, you know, Eric and Mo and Carter, y'all are shining examples of, of finding your path in life, being passionate about what you do and building a, a life and a lifestyle around that. It's a real inspiration, a real honor for me to be associated with the likes of you guys. And uh, to circle back, I think I really want to drive this point home for anybody listening who might disagree with our, our point of view on industry. We all drive trucks, we're gun owners, we're outdoors people. Um, we're not taking an affiliation with any political side here. We're basically, we're, we're speaking about what we know, which is, is our, 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 our care and our interest in, in, in passing on a healthy environment, a healthy ecosystem, a healthy outdoors recreational um, inheritance to our children, to the next generation. And so I, I just want people to look past politics and focus on, on, on what they're doing in their own lives, whether it's wa over water and a vanity lawn or, or drinking cases of plastic water bottles. There's, there's another way that makes you feel better about yourself and how you're living and it ultimately contributes to passing on a healthier natural resource that we're so fortunate to have in this country. I can't think of any greater purpose in one's life than, than living to enhance the surroundings in which you exist. And so, um, my hat's off to you guys for what you do, and thanks for letting me be part of it. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Yeah. JT, I loved it, and I appreciate everything you said about that. You're spot on, and, um, you know, I don't know. Next time Yeti has an event, hope they invite all of us. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be in touch, and uh, I've got my third chit. I'm about to be delivered uh, middle of next week. Luckily, the, the shop... And Stuart is, is cranking away, getting my platform on. And so I, I got a little tunnel version. I'd love to whip you around on the really wow flats of, of, of Texas one of these times if you got an opening. Uh, whether All right. it's you go or whether it's just you coming down to hang, man, I look forward to it. You could, after Venice, keep going west, Carter. That's right. Well, well okay. barbecue and Mexican food and live it up down here, buddy. <laughs> sounds good. That's me. That's right there. That's right up my alley. All right. Well, hey, thanks, you guys, and we'll talk to you soon. Be careful. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, guys. See Bye -bye. Cheers.